Hi, welcome to the 2017 <laughs> Iowa City Book Festival presented by the Iowa City UNESCO, right? UNESCO, yes, uh, City of Literature. We would like to thank the sponsors who have made this event possible. The City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, the Iowa Arts Council, the Iowa City Coralville Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Iowa Public Radio, and the Tuesday Agency. The vast majority of book festival events are offered without charge, but they are not free. Your tax-deductible donation gives us the ability to offer programs like this festival. Please consider supporting the City of Literature by texting the word BOOK to 319-774-7669 and follow the link. And it's also available on uh, the bookmarks that, that you have received. Um, I'm going to briefly just introduce our, our panelists and our moderator, and then I will be out of the way. Today, as part of the panel discussion, A Sense of Place, we will hear from Anne Kennedy, Audrey Chin, Jacqueline Vincenta, Will barden Werper, and Larry Baker, who will discuss the role that setting and place play in their writing. Can a literary work be, truly be universal, or will place always determine how a piece is understood? This panel will be moderated by Natasha Durovica. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, House editor of the International Writing Program book series and the 91st Meridian Journal. Larry Baker is an adjunct instructor of American history at Kirkwood Community College in Cedar Rapids. His books include The Flamingo Rising, a Los Angeles Times Top 100 book for 1997, Athens slash America, A Good Man, nominated for Book of the Year by the Southeast Independent Booksellers Association, and Love and Other Delusions. His new book is the novel From a Dins Distance, and I was lucky enough to hear a passage from that uh, just an hour ago. He was included on the Iowa Literary Walk of Fame in 2010 and was twice elected to the City Council of Iowa City. Will barden Werper is an American writer specializing in narrative nonfiction. He's the author of The Prisoner in His Palace, Saddam Hussein, His American Guards, and What History Leaves Unsaid, which was published by Scribner this summer. The book was, is woven from first-hand accounts provided by many of the American guards, government officials, interrogators, scholars, spies, lawyers, family members, and victims. Audrey Chin is a fiction and nonfiction writer from Singapore. She has a doctorate in public policy and worked in investment banking. Her story collection, Nine Cuts, was shortlisted for the 2016 Singapore Literature Prize. <clears throat> Anne Kennedy is a fiction writer, screenwriter, and poet from New Zealand. She received the 2013 New Zealand Post Book Award for Poetry for the Darling North. In 2014, her novel, The Last Days of the National Costume, was a finalist for the New Zealand Post Book Award and was long listed for the I Am, oh, the Impact Dublin Award. And Jacqueline Vicenta graduated from the University of Iowa with a degree in English literature with honors in creative writing and has made language the center of her career ever since then. Vincenza's first paid writing job was as a police beat reporter for the Slidell, Louisiana Daily News, and her current nonfiction job is as a blog writer and copywriter for the Prague-based translation company, oh. Scrivonic. Scrivonic, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Vincenza writes fiction from her home in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and her new novel is The Lake and the Lost Girl. Please help me welcome our panelists. Good morning, and thank you all for coming on this uh, damp day. I will just read a brief description, and then uh, we will go in the order and Kennedy, as it is, um, excuse me? Oh, yeah, oh, there we go. Well, that's, that's a lesson to us all, because the questions that, we would, that you would like to ask of the writers need to be spoken through the microphone, which is at the back of the room, so please be prepared. Um, so the, the description of the panel is as follows. Place and setting are key in many kinds of writing. How do you convey a sense of place or paint a unique landscape? In what way does location contribute to your writing? Can a literary work truly be universal, or will place always determine how a piece is understood? 
and we will go in the order of my uh, of the the program, which is Anne Kennedy, Audrey Chin, Jacqueline Vincenta, Will Barden Wimper, and finally Larry Baker. So, please, Anne. Thank you. So, can I speak through here? This is mm -hmm. where yeah. I have to go up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Kia ora koutou. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you for having us here. Thanks very much to the festival and to the um, Iowa Writers' Program. Um, and thank you, Natasa. Um, I come from a country of only 4 million people. Four, I think it's about 4.2 now, it's sort of growing fast, but tiny and, <clears throat> excuse me, geographically isolated New Zealand. We're at, right at the bottom of the world, or the top, depending on how you think of it. Um, so when I was growing up as a Pākehā or European New Zealander, we didn't want for much, but what we did want for was stories about ourselves. Um, as a former British colony, um, most of the literature we read, and indeed um, most of our culture, was received from the UK. Um, to make matters even more complicated for me, as the um, descendant of Irish, I wasn't even English, um, my family's existence in New Zealand was sort of um, littered with this whole series of rifts. But there were some examples of local literature, um, namely Catherine Mansfield, who'd written in the early part of the 20th century, um, James K. Baxter and Sam Hunt, poets, um, and when I encountered them at about age 13, I was hugely excited because I felt like, here's someone who, who sounds like me, who's writing about the place I, I'm in, and I'd literally never come across that before. Like everything up to the age of 13 had been about somewhere else. So, that, so I grew up with a sense of like, we live in this um, sort of fragile, slightly unreal place, even though my daily life wasn't like that. But in the, sen in the sense of an imaginative world that was being presented to me, it was all about somewhere else. So at age 13, being confronted with um, Sam Hunt, actually, who is a, um, he's sort of the most popular kind of bard in New Zealand. And I remember reading a poem by him that, um, that went something like, um, acne flowers, scarlet on their cheeks, those kids up Pōrirua East. And I thought, this is, this is me, this is my life. So from then on, I'd been writing up until then, but then I sort of much more seriously approached the, the task of representing this place that I live in. Um, that I wanted to, to reveal our, our voices, our, like our, sent, our geographical place, all the things that made us us. Um, and I've been doing that for 30 years. A few other things, but that's been part of the, my, the impulse of my writing. Um, so I... Um, I, I, realize, I think I realized then that place, um, uh, place and writing about place uh, transcends the actual place that you're living in in order to reveal the actual place. So it's, it's sort of like a strange loop. And, and I, I think that's, that often goes on in, in writing that's um, definitively focused on place. So um, I can't talk about my country without just saying something briefly about the Treaty of Waitangi which is the treaty between the Māori people, the indig indigenous people of New Zealand, um, and the English crown, and that's the founding document of the nation. And without that, I, I would not be living in New Zealand. There would be no, the, the colonizers would not have come there. So um, I talked about this at the um, uh, library panel that was on a few weeks ago, the IWP panel at the library. So I don't want to repeat myself, but if anyone's interested in this, you could look up on the um, International Writers' Programme um, website, where all the papers that were presented at those panels are, are there to read. Um, so my, my sense of place as a writer um, is characterised then by rifts of um, colonisation, rifts of migration, rifts of a sense of erasure of place. But I suspect that rifts like that um, are a fact for, for everybody, writers, non-writers, everybody. Um, 
Because our, our place in the world um, really is sort of riven with existential crises about where we are. It's strange that we're here. So I think that that actually the, the, the really big conversation about place is like, why are we on this planet and what are we doing here? But um, perhaps we don't have time to, to go into that today. <laughs> um, but, but I do think that imaginative writing is a way to, um, to reach out to others and say, this is what it's like here in this place. Um, so I think what's key to that is um, who's speaking. Like, what, what is it like in this place from this point of view, from my point of view, from our point of view in this landscape? Because, of course, all of us see um, our place differently. We all have a subjective view of place. So one wonderful example of that um, recently that's come to mind, of course, is um, Kazuo Ishiguro, who just recently won the Nobel Prize. Um, so he grew up Japanese in the UK, a place not renowned for its sort of welcoming attitude towards other. Um, and after his first initial novels, um, wrote a novel infiltrating white English people um, and sort of exploding them with, from within with spectacular results. Um, so the, the place that I write about, um, mostly New Zealand, has changed massively over the last sort of 40 years, um, politically and socially, environmentally, and so my writing has altered accordingly. Um, my last novel, this, um, The Last Days of the National Costume, um, um, <clears throat> which was about the 1998 um, blackout that occurred in Auckland, um, um, the result of a, not my novel, but the blackout was the result of a neoliberal government that basically doesn't care about its people. And so this novel is utterly about place. Um, and interestingly, while I was researching for this novel, I, um, I sort of discovered some things about the place I live in that I hadn't known before. And so perhaps that's something that might come up later in this discussion, that um, we, don't, we don't always know our place. Um, we, you know, um, levels of place are revealed to us in different ways as we go along, or not. Um, in the end, writing about place transcends place in order to bring us back to place. So I'd like to finish with a very quick poem. Um, another place I've lived in the world is Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii. I lived there for 10 years and taught at the university there. Um, and so that sort of brings in another whole um, range of ideas about place. So I'm going to read um, a sonnet that I wrote there called Work, which um, now, looking at this, this poem, um, it seems to strangely and sadly prefigure what's happening right now politically in America. Work, it's called work. The most asked question is, do your cocktails have umbrellas in them? It's true that here we have learned to make pineapple bombers, but no, that thing on the rim of the glass is the sun going down on America. When I first looked out from Waikiki, I thought I was seeing the Pacific Ocean for the first time. People think we lie under umbrellas at the beach all the time, but no, mostly life goes on just the same. I am still planning my book, Talking Loudly, a self-help guide for better communication between the members of rock bands, seeing a need which has not diminished with distance. I am reading narrowly, just as I always did, a sharp point under which there is no shade. Thank you. Hello. Well, thank you everybody for coming out in the rain and 
Thank you, Natasha, for soon to be asking us probing questions. And thank you for all the organizers. I'm happy to be here with all my fellow panelists. I come from Singapore, which is a country which only became a country in 1965, and before that was a port of call and a passage through. And so for me, and, and in my life, um, I have lived, I lived half my life in Singapore and then only half my life later went back to live in Singapore. And after I lived in Singapore, I spent half my life on airplanes traveling around the world. And after I retired from that job, I spent half my life going to Vietnam, which was the home of the man I married. So in as much as I have to write about a sense of place, I I think I have to write about my body and its experience in it. And when we did a masterclass with Bonnie Sunstein, who heads the nonfiction writing program, she said, well, what you need to tell people about is sort of the thing that you like to do and the thing that you like to write about. And I realized that the thing that I really like to do is to give PowerPoint presentations, which is no longer available. <laughs> So the first chart is actually of a shape of a meditating person, um, all written out in words. And what I really like to do is I like to meditate. And my belief is that in as much as I am a consciousness in a body, living in or on a body, and writing about bodies you know, who have consciousnesses, because I write very character-driven things, then place and the senses of that place are really the core of my writing process. And I just like to, people end with readings, but I'd like to start with one. And it's really what I believe about writing that our bodies remember the earthed bodies as the marked earth remembers the markings we make as somewhere out there beyond those orbiting bodies Something knows. These lines from this skin were cut by a hollowed reed. Only woundedness and emptying allows the bloodlines to flow into words and into story. And so then we move on to the next chart, which is really like, this is all very airy-fairy. What the hell do you mean? You know, that you say you read the Libra Mundi, you read the Book of the World, and you respond to the artifacts to write your story and set your place. And then after that, your characters act in the world of that story, and that is how I convey place and setting. What does it mean? So my first book, Learning to Fly, is about um, it's a coming-of-age story about an anthropologist who has an affair with a much older botanist, and it is set in the rainforest of um, Borneo and in Singapore, and it really talks about indigenous people and their loss of land, the loss of their place. And because they've lost their place, a lot of the story and the structure of the whole novel is in terms of a song line, a chant, just like Australian indigenous people find their way homes through songs. So a lot of what happened was, why did I come to write this story? Well, Singapore was inundated with a haze. I have a lovely picture of a haze that you can't see through. And it was the first haze we suffered from the forest being burnt around us. And so from that, you know, came the story. And then how do I tell this story and how do I talk about the place? And I decided that the story and the place had to be written in the forms of um, a song line. So it's much better to read to convey how you convey place than to talk about it. So. This is the woman walking through the jungle. I did not make it up the Tinja River and to the Usan Upper with my people that time. But like Tinja's son, there was no doubt I had undergone an initiation and taken part in a rite of passage with ha which had, within a moon cycle, made me Penan, the tribe she was with. The change was gradual. I peeled off civilization like my shirts and socks, like the 
leeches which inevitably attached themselves to my legs, discarding it all each day as we moved deeper and deeper into the forest, slowly leaving the inessentials behind. As I followed Tinja and his brothers, who followed the hunting, until one morning I found I had totally lost my bearings and sense of time. My reality had become the brush of branches in my face, the crackling of dried leaves, and the feel of the tree roots against my soles as we walked hour after seemingly endless hour through liquid green gloom, the slippery mush of sago starch through my toes when we stopped to make camp and harvest our next meal. Nyapun singing, bringing us back to our beginnings every night. That was the sum of my world, nothing else, for nearly a month, until Tinja took me out onto a jungle jetty by a longhouse settlement on the Baram, and I took the longboat down to Marudi to meet my husband again. And it's, so it's not even really about the place. I'm not saying there's a butterfly there and a, you know, a root here, but I write about bodies and how bodies experience place. In um, my second book, which is a non-fiction book, um, it was called Singapore Women Re Represented. And what I did there was it was a commission to write the social history of Singapore women and by the archives. So what we did was listen to a lot of stories, look at a lot of materials. Um, Singapore Chinese Creole women who are called Peranakan wore Malay outfits like this. And this one actually happens to belong to my grandmother, who did not have the title deeds to the house, which she got from the dowry, which she gave her husband. But she did end up dying with a three cupboardfuls of clothes. So that understanding of the artifacts, the fact that women didn't own anything except their clothes, I think prompted that whole story, yes. And so that was the second book I wrote, which was again based on bodies and how you describe place. And the third book I wrote was about 60 years in the life of a Vietnamese man. I'm not Vietnamese. I go to Viet. I did happen to be married to that man for more than 30 years, so I guess that lends some authenticity. And I really, really wish I had the charts, uh, the pictures to show you the sense of place that was invoked, because I wrote the story from a little wooden, a little bangle, which was the only thing that I got when I went back to Vietnam after having been married for 15 years. And it was a metal bangle. It was the only thing the family could save to give me because they had sold everything else off while trying to live under the communists. And then the bangle was in a house that was falling down. And then there were things, you know, other artifacts like these bullets, that these shell heads that you get. And on the communist shell heads, they're called quit tang, there's a word, which means to sacrifice all to win. And you wonder what was sacrificed. And so from, from these objects, you go to see the places that made these objects and the places where the objects were hidden. And, and so, you know, you just sit quietly and as you say, if you empty yourself and you allow the pain and the wounds to come in, then, then you just write. I mean, the place comes, yeah? It's not as if you sort of say, now let me think, did the room have brown bricks or did the room have falling down panels? It is really that once you've allowed your body to inhabit those places, and my last three books have been really more into social realism about Singapore. And so I hang around Singapore a lot and watch people and talk to them. And I write social realism. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, and thank you very much for having me. Thanks for coming. And I'm very moved by both of these writers' words about the sense of place. One of the things that I have experienced in the last couple of days being back in Iowa City where I haven't been for over three decades is the sense of place that lives in my body. As you're talking about the body being really the vessel for which all of this knowledge is, comes through and is stored and then comes into the stories. 
it's been such a strange thing to walk along and feel familiar things that I didn't even know I remembered, the shape of the land, the smell of things, and I find myself listening and watching for clues about the past, clues about that I remembered about Iowa City. And I think that this knowledge that lives in the body is definitely called up when we create a story, when we create a character. One of the things that I did immediately, just instinctively, uh, my story was born of an idea about a character who was basically emotionally tyrannizing the other people in his family. And immediately when I saw the, the first seed of the story, I also saw water. And water was an escape for the characters. And, it was in, and so as the story developed, it, it became set on Lake Michigan. And Lake Michigan was not only a source of inspiration, a source of solace for characters in the, in the Lake and the Lost Girl, a source of escape was, was what it was also for the main character at the core of the mystery, which is set in the past. And I'm going to read a short passage to show you how that was used. It's something we're all familiar with when we've read anything or taken an English class the use of a familiar setting to show the internal landscape. Now, the character in the present that is, is in this scene is a woman named Lydia Carroll who is searching for writings by the poet in the past. Before returning to her house, Lydia drove a f to the lighthouse and pier where Mary, that's the poet that disappeared in the past, had last been seen so long ago. She turned the jeep off, wrapped a blanket around herself, and watched the water rise and fall against the jetty. For a long time, she stared at its flow from the channel, until it rolled at last from black to mercury silver in the morning light. Fishermen came and went, and seagulls cried. She stared so long and so intently that she felt herself standing on that pier, wind whipping, rain lashing, desperation and morphine racing through her veins. It was all too easy to imagine a domineering husband bearing down on her, to feel the reckless desire to escape. One thing that suicide had going for it was that death left no open doors from this world. So the um, lake represented, Lake, lake Michigan is like a, a salt-free sea. It's a freshwater sea. And it's, when you stand on the edge, you can't see the other side. And it has big storms that come up. It swallows ships. It's, it's very dramatic uh, character. It was a wonderful thing to have. And the lake shore as well. The, the trees, the sand dunes, the orchards, the, the ability to escape. Had I written, and I don't mean just the big escapes that happen, but, but just to hide, to be, to be alone, to be protected by the land. All of these things were in me from my experience on Lake Michigan and became part of my story through the other characters. In addition, there, was, uh, there were scenes from the past that I researched and knew inklings about the, the men in the story said in the, the past portions of the story were fishermen, boat builders, and lumbermen. And this, of course, is completely connected to the land. And as I found clues, little details about th those ways of making a living, those lifestyles, those, the time period, which is the 1930s, this also changed the characters, the characters' ability to do things, the characters' way of feeling. All of this would have, was, was altered by place. But I think that one of the reasons this doesn't make a work too specific and in fact, the more specific you are, it can become more universal, is that what we're showing when we write about a place that we've absorbed, that we've come to understand, is we are showing the way we relate to it, the way that someone reacts to atmosphere, to, to the, the buildings around them, to the emptiness around them. That's all something we're familiar with. If we read a story set in Iran that's done with beautiful detail, we're able to relate to that human experience of being somewhere and of, of being affected by a place. So that's, that's what I wanted to share today. Thank you again. Hello, um, my name is Will Bardenwerper, and um, my book, The Prisoner's Palace, is an account of the 12 
American soldiers who were responsible for guarding Saddam and the months prior to his execution and then ultimately um, being ordered to deliver him to the gallows. Um, and uh, what it really discusses is the improbable relationships that developed between these soldiers and their captive. Um, and also I think it reveals a little bit about how um, playing the role in the death of someone you've grown to know as a human being and who you've watched pray and sleep and eat and who you've communicated with can be uh, far more challenging psychologically than um, you know, shooting at an anonymous target in combat from 200 meters away. And I'm not suggesting that's easy, but what these soldiers did was, was very different. Um, and I guess I would emphasize also that it's not an Iraq policy book. It's not a, a biography of Saddam. Um, you know, I, I don't want to sound pretentious, but I really do think it's about some of the mysteries of, of being human. Um, and um, as far as the role of place, one thing that my editor emphasized to me from almost the beginning of the project was that I want you to write filmically, was a word he always used. I want you to appeal to the five senses of the reader, um, which was very difficult for me because I wasn't there. I was an American soldier in Iraq, actually at the same time as this execution took place, but I was in a different part of the country doing different sorts of missions. Um, and so I had to rely almost ex well, ex exclusively on the people who were there um, and gather that information in the course of interviews because it's nonfiction. I couldn't make it up. Um, if I was describing a, a set-in or a scene, it had to be the way that it really was. And so in the course of hours and hours of interviews, I'm sure the soldiers you know, looked at me like, why is this guy so interested in you know, what the temperature in the room was at the time, or what the color of the chair was, or you know, any number of details that they probably thought were very insignificant, but were actually very important to enabling the reader to, to visualize what was happening. Um, so um, I guess what I'll do is just read two brief scenes, um, one from the introduction that I think does kind of just set the stage for what's going to occur later and then one that um, introduces, I think, one of the more important themes of the book, or questions, I guess you could say, that the book raises. Um, and then I'll, be, I'll actually be at Prairie Lights at 2.30, so if anyone wants to learn more about the book, feel free to stop by. Um, so here's the scene from the introduction, and what's happening here is these soldiers who had spent the last four months, um, really, guarding's not even the right word, really kind of living alongside, caring for, and getting to know Saddam, um, are told in the middle of the night that tonight's the night that you're going to bring him to be executed. Um, uh, it was eerily quiet as the 13-ton rhino began rumbling across the compound in the chilly pre-dawn hours. There was none of the casual banter that usually accompanied missions, none of the familiar jokes volleyed between buddies who'd grown to know each other's idiosyncrasies, just silence. After a short ride, it was time to turn the man over. He rose from his seat near the back of the rhino and carefully straightened his black pea coat, making sure it wasn't rumpled from the brief ride. One of the soldiers had carefully applied a lint roller to it before they'd left his cell. The man began to walk slowly from his seat near the back toward the front door. As he made his way to the front of the dimly lit vehicle, he stopped to grasp each of the 12 young Americans and, in a few cases, to whisper final private words. Some of the soldiers now had tears in their eyes. When the old man reached the front, he turned to them one last time and said, may God be with you. With that, he bowed slightly and turned toward the door. Um, so, and what I, one of the things I was trying to achieve there was to suggest that something had developed between these people, but not to go too far overboard because at that point the reader didn't have any context and, and, and I didn't want to give too much away. Um, uh, I wanted there to be some, you know, sense of mystery as as, as readers, you know, moved through the the book, and 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 um, so it was kind of a balancing act to suggest that there's kind of more than meets the eye, but not to be too transparent about it. And then the last scene that I will read, and this, um, I think, introduces a few questions that I hope the book succeeds in in raising. And what's happening here is there's an army medic who. Um, who was responsible for caring for Saddam every day. He would go in and make sure that, that he was doing well. 
Uh, after Abu Ghraib and those different prisoner abuses, the Americans were very concerned about any even suggestion that he was being mistreated. Um, so you know, if he were to show up in court with a black eye, that would immediately be broadcast around the world, and the assumption would be that the Americans had done something to him, whether or not they had. But in the course of this medic treating him every day, they actually grew to develop, I think, what you could call an actual friendship. Anyway, the medic had grown up in a very rough neighborhood in the United States, and he had gotten word that his brother was dying uh, from drug problems and that he would have to go home to America to, to say goodbye to his brother. And he actually went out of his way to stop by Saddam's cell to let him know so that Saddam was not upset by you know, an un unexpected absence, which I think suggests a lot about the nature of their relationship. While the news came as a surprise, Ellis had long known that Larry had been traveling a dangerous and self-destructive road mixed up with drugs, alcohol, and petty crime. After Ellis had taken a few minutes to collect himself, he hurriedly packed his bags and began what would be another marathon journey home. That afternoon, sitting in Baghdad's passenger terminal, coated in sweat and surrounded by an assortment of other soldiers heading home on leave, Ellis felt his mind wander. Moments like these in which a person is suddenly yanked from the desensitizing daily grind can sometimes engender brief epiphanies. He realized it had been six months to the day since his mother had died. Later, strapped into the seat of the C-130, Ellis felt anger boiling up. He was angry to once again be marooned overseas during turmoil at home, angry at his brother for having made so many resolutions over the years to reform only to again succumb to temptation. Besides the deep ache of what he knew would likely be his brother's death, Ellis recognized something else was nagging him, something he'd just experienced and couldn't make sense of. Before he'd left for the airfield, Ellis had made an impromptu visit to Saddam to let him know about his brother and that he'd be going home and wouldn't be checking on him for a week or so. Ellis didn't want Saddam to wonder where he'd gone. The medic shared the truth partly out of a sense of duty since he was responsible for Saddam's well-being, but also because, as much as he may have hated to admit it, he found himself not wanting Saddam to be upset. As it turned out, the feeling may have been mutual. After Ellis was done explaining that he was losing his brother and would be gone for a while, Saddam stood up, hugged him, and said, I will be your brother. And... <laughs> Once again, thank you all for being here. What I would like to do is sort of start at the top of a whirlpool and sort of funnel down to the question of setting. And on the, outs the top part, I'm gonna talk about where my new book came from. It's called From a Distance. And if you think that title sounds like a song title, you're right. Um, the character remembers that song late in her story and she finally figures out that's what she's been missing, the perspective of time and distance to figure out who she is. So that's one point. Second point, I was lucky. My first book was published by Knopf. I got to work with Sonny Mehta. A lot of you know who that is. And I got to go to New York and he set me down in his apartment and we worked on the book for three days. And it's a fascinating character. Sonny is a, and I don't know whether to say he's British Indian or Indian British, via London to New York City, an ex if the word cosmopolitan means anything, Sonny is the representative of that. Um, and it dawned on me 20 years ago, he's still an outsider. He's on the top of the most pu powerful publishing company at the time. Um, and he's in a world that is not his home. And so the first aspect of setting that, that struck me as I'm writing my book is home is the original setting. And you go back to it over and over again, if nothing else in your memory, but as soon as you start doing that, home changes. So I wanted to write about a powerful person in an alien environment. And so that situation came out of my experience working with Knopf to begin with. The other thing was, as a writer, I'm absolutely fascinated by the question of point of view. I mean, I think it's the first decision a writer has to make. Who and how are you telling your story? And one of the most fascinating books to me in the recent years was this Alice Sebold book, The Lovely Bones, told from the point of view of a dead woman, dead girl. I thought, well, let's try that. Except it's not the present tense voice of a dead person, it's the journals and diaries of a dead person who wants to come back and haunt the, the man that she's in love with. 
So my book is structured this way. We open up with a first person point of view of an insane dead woman who's at the time 13 years old, go into a third person point of view story about the publisher, the, the, the most powerful man in America. And they don't seem to have anything in common except slowly as these parallel chapters start adding up, you figure out that what this girl is talking about, this secret love, obsessive love, is this public figure over here, and nobody knows that she exists in his public life. Um, now, flashback to my relationship with Sonny. Um, he had an assistant editor named Jenny, and what struck me is in this relationship was that he basically trusted her. She did enormous, she had enormous power. She could make decisions, unlike most assistant editors, she could say, Sonny, I wanna buy this book. And he would say, fine, I trust you. Um, so that relationship is another situation. And so what I wanted to do was like, what happens, and here's where I have to point out that that's the only connection to reality in my past. Those two characters are real and they inspired two other characters but if they were to read this book, they would say, that's not us, and that's intentional. What if this assistant editor has been in love with this publisher, this editor, all these years, and he's never reciprocated that? And she doesn't understand why. And in fact, he's never been involved with anybody. Well, it turns out the first third-person chapter is he gets this manuscript, which is nothing more than a 1,000 pages of notes and journals, and they're, the, they're written by a woman over the span of 40 years. And so what I as a writer had to do was like, how do I show the first person evolution of a voice that's consistent over time and also insane? So how does this insane voice become more articulate and more insightful over time? That's what I'm trying to do and as Bobby turns over the manuscript to his assistant, it doesn't take her very long to figure out that the story that this dead woman is telling is the story of her and her boss. And she finally has to absorb the dead woman's voice to make the editor, the publisher, happy. Um, now, setting. What's an alien environment for all of this? I chose two places, Charleston, South Carolina, and New York City. Now, New York is the obvious publishing home, but I wanted a, a New York City, not of today, but a New York City of the 1970s. So when I started writing this, it is the first book I've actually had to do research on. I had to talk to people in New York. I had, you know, tell me, what did you do for fun in 1970 that you didn't, would, wouldn't want to admit to somebody else? What were the clubs like? What were the issues, the danger involved? Because as, as Bobby, as a young man, goes to New York City for the first time, his father says to him, I'm sending you into the belly of the beast. Just be very careful. Because Bobby is from Charleston. That's his home. Now, I teach American history. Charleston has a lot of significance in American history. You can go back to the beginning, you can go back to the 1830s with John C. Calhoun, you can go back to the Democratic Convention in 1860 which split apart the Democratic Party, you can talk about Fort Sumter. Charleston is the essence of the South. Bobby, the character in my book, is from the South. He is an alien in New York in the 1970s and 80s. How do I convey what New York was like to him, but how do I deal with the real question which is, where is your home? What is the setting of your home? And setting is not geography and buildings. Setting is also culture. What is the culture that shaped you? Now, my problem as a writer and as a history teacher is I know too much about Southern culture. And I know you'll find it hard to believe, but I'm not from Iowa. <laughs> I was born in Louisiana and raised in Texas. I mean, I have this, I have this baggage from a long way back. Um, I, I am fascinated by the Southern perception of itself and reality. Um, Bobby comes from the upper stratus, strata of Charleston society. The girl who is writing about him, the, the girl who is in love with him, the girl who is insane and crazy, 
She comes, and I, I'm from the South, so I can say this. She comes from white trash Charleston. She will never be able to be in Bobby's world. But he cannot get rid of her. He cannot leave her. They meet when she is 13. He is 16. He catches her stealing a book at a bookstore. So I have to go back. And I've been to Charleston once. I know about it. I, I was friends with Pat Conroy and his brother Tim. And obviously Pat Conroy's fiction is an influence on this book as well. I talked to them. Tell me about Charleston. Tell me about Charleston in the past, in the 1960s and 70s. And then I had to find out about the parks because all of the chapters from the point of view of the insane woman are the chapters in Charleston. So I have the reality of Charleston that has to be filtered by someone who is crazy. <laughs> so the Charleston people have to recognize Charleston even though it doesn't seem to be Charleston. And you know, the parks are important, the restaurants, the bookstores, all of this I have to find out about. It doesn't come naturally to me. And so I'm, my favorite story of writing this story was the fact that I had seen in, in, a, in a church, St. John the Baptist Church in Charleston. And I had the characters, the insane character, sort of remembering having the boy taking him to the church and having him lay in her like She's sitting there in the pew. It's a sanctuary against the abuse she gets at home. And he's laying there with his head on her lap looking up. I didn't, I didn't know what that, what that looked like. So I called St. John the Baptist Church. And for lack of a better term, I'll call her the church lady. She was very nice to me. And she's like, oh, you're a writer. Oh, that's, I know, Pat. I said, here's what I need. I need you to go into the church. You're going to sell, get a cell phone. Go into the church. Lay down on a pew. <laughs> and then as, you're, as I'm there on the phone, describe what you see. And she says, you're serious? I said, yeah. She says, oh, that sounds like fun. So, <laughs> She goes, she goes and lays down, and she looks up, and there's this scene in the book where she is, what she described to me, I have to transpose into the same vision, except all of those symbols, the Peter and Paul apostles, have to be transposed into symbolic figures in this insane mind, and still be, if somebody from Charleston read this, say, yeah, I know exactly what you're looking at here. You know, I had to go over and over again to understand the little details of the setting of Charleston to convey a story about a schizophrenic world, Southern gentility, and I don't know what the other word is, Southern something, reality. And, and to compound that issue, I had to have another Southern character, the assistant editor, who comes from Savannah, and she describes herself as, I'm New South, Bobby, you are Old South. And she constantly sort of pricks him and says, you know, you're, you're living in an idealized, idealized world, and as he points out to her, we're, we're both living in an idealized world. And the whole publishing world that we exhibit doesn't exist. I mean, this is not a realistic story about publishing. It's a not, you, you want to do that? Write a nonfiction book, and it's not glamorous. It's a business. I want to write about the mythology of the South, the mythology of New York, the mythology of publishing. So let me close with the very last line of the book, and I guarantee this is not giving anything away. <laughs> but it is the essence of the story as one character says, Bobby, come home. I'm waiting for you. And that's the thrust of the story coming back to where you began. Thank you. Hey, So I suspect there are questions, and this is the time to ask them. And would you please use the microphone in the back of the room? Thank you. Oh, I thought that was a slow pace towards the microphone. That, that was not what's happening. He kept <laughs> while, yeah, while you're, while you're thinking about your question, I'm going to ask the first one, which is, can you write um, from a place which you have not actually visited. So I was very interested in Will's idea of getting the details exactly right. Larry pretty much says the same thing, that there has to be a kind of an authenticity of detail in order for this to work. Could you is it possible to write a novel from a place that you really have no physical experience, ideally firsthand from? Yes. Yeah, and absolutely. I guess that's the, 
That's the trick of fiction, is describing <laughs> something in a way that, you know, it's, you're, you're making it new, and so it doesn't actually need to be somewhere where you've been before, and there are many examples. Actually, one from New Zealand is um, The Vintner's Luck by Elizabeth Knox, which is set in um, 18th century, no, 19th century Belgium. She's never been there. There are many, many examples. And I guess um, speculative fiction also, a world building, creates a world that nobody has ever been to. So, um, so it stands to reason that you don't need to be in the place to, to use all the sort of techniques of fiction to create it for the reader. Though you would almost have to say it's a whole genre in itself, right? Writing from a place you know nothing about. That's sci-fi, you might say, right? But No, I mean, you could write about real places that you hadn't been to. I mean, I, I don't think I could. I could write about imaginary places that that I've never been to, but if you write about places that exist and you haven't been to, I would, I, I mean, I'm so law abiding, right? I keep, I keep thinking people say, oh, you're a fraud, you know, it wasn't there. <laughs> I think that if we did that, if you were to write about a place that you really hadn't been, even if you've done a lot of research, what you would be bringing to it to make it authentic and alive would be your experience of other places, the way that those places live in you. And for the people who are from Iowa City, I would point out that one of my novels is grounded, is set in Iowa City, obviously. I mean, every detail of the story is Iowa City. It's a political novel. And after that got published in Iowa City, I never won another election. Uh. <laughs> Do you want to name names? I'll remind no, us of the no, title. No. no. The problem I mean was the I, didn't, I didn't hide enough. I don't mean the, I don't mean the na names of the people in, in the book. I mean the name of the book itself. Oh, it's, it's, it's called Athens, America. <laughs> oh, we're so flattered. So, any other questions from the audience? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pete, maybe. I'll ask a question. Uh, you said, uh, you mentioned Iowa City. Um, do you, since we're in Iowa, we're at the Iowa Writers Festival, do you have any novels or books uh, set in Iowa or the Midwest that are your favorites? And how do you assess the health of regional writing about the Midwest in Iowa? I should be able to answer that question, <laughs> but I really can't. Um, uh, I, I will admit to uh, not having read a lot of novels based in the Midwest. Certainly Jane Smiley comes to mind. Um, Robert James Waller, but I don't know if that's a good example or not. Um, so I, I, somebody has an answer to that question. I hope it's somebody on this panel, <laughs> but I, I wish I, I could help you. I actually read two pieces of, I had not heard of Iowa, the Iowa Writers' Workshop. And I, wrote, I read short, short fiction, not big works. And they were by Vietnamese American writers about 30 to 45 years old. Who, well, one was Vietnamese American, one was Vietnamese Australian. And they um, attended the writers' workshop. And one of them I, is Dow Strom, but the other one is a guy who writes about the Iowa River and how he's trying to write his father's life story. And so it's a piece of fiction where his father comes and throws all the pieces of paper into the river. And now I have a room and it looks out into the river and I go, ha ha, that's how it happened. You, you remember the guy, right? <laughs> and while I'm thinking about it, let me add two more names. Haven Kimmel and John McNally, I think are very good writers for this region. I've come across, I, I read fiction by other Michigan authors fairly frequently. One of them, Bonnie Jo Campbell, who has uh, published a few, no a few novels and short story collections in recent years that, that are vivid, uh, vivid depictions of rural Michigan. Uh, Jim Harrison, who's written for, I mean, he's not alive anymore, but... Uh, just read a wonderful novel by uh, Melissa Fraterigo, who's here in the audience. And this is published by University of Nebraska Press. And I'm wondering now, after reading her novel, how many more pieces like this there might be out there that aren't in the mainstream yet. And, and not to be specifically Iowa, but Midwest, um, Jonathan Franson. Mm -hmm. So for me, like coming from outside America or outside the mainland of America, um, Jonathan Franson sort of 
is the Midwest. <laughs> well, and, I mean, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood is probably the paradigmatic narrative or creative uh, nonfiction book. He's certainly, I don't think you'd call him a Midwestern writer, but he did a pretty wonderful job of bringing that town to life. <laughs> In its own way, right. Uh-huh. Peter? Did you want to ask a question? Well, I was just trying to persuade him to go before me because I was going to manufacture a question because I enjoyed the panel very much. The issues that you talked about with the writings and so on, I found them recurring and appearing in some form or other in books, novels I teach, the things I wrote, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, but I do have one, and I have noticed that one of the obsessions with many writers uh, these days is uh, time. Time, how do you deal with time as you're going on? Is time moving faster, slower? How do you slow it down? How do you speed it up as a writer? Um, uh, okay, I'll mention, mention one example to show what I mean. I. I uh, wrote a novel uh, uh, that was my second novel about the expulsion of Asians from Uganda by Idi Amin. And in real life, he announced the expulsion in, in uh, three months. The deadline was three months. And when I wrote the novel, it just, it just took off. Uh, and uh, I kept it at three months. But when I finished the novel, I found that uh, in real life, Three months was a short time that drove everybody frantic in real life, but in a novel, it was really not fast. And I just mentioned this to a Quincy. It was not enough to, it, it just didn't work. And I mentioned this to Supreme a Quincy, and he said, well, why don't you make it by the next moon? After all, you know, Idi Amin was Muslim and, and, and all that, and that worked. I wondered then, uh, when you're writing, uh, uh, a novel where setting is important, whether whether it was directly about the setting or indirectly. I mean, it just turned up. What uh, what happens if you have chosen a setting that seems to be that is real, but you really need some things in that setting that are not in the real life setting? Okay. What do you do? There we go. How, can somebody take that on? It's a novel, right? You can do what you like. <laughs> um, th- I think that's a really interesting question about time and place. Bec- and um, the the subject of the the body came up in this panel. Mm-hmm. And I think you know uh, the fact that we're we're bodies living in time in this place. So that's always a concern. So um, so. A few things. It's such a, a big subject. Just firstly, I want to say um, I, I teach creative writing, and so pace, which is how time travels through writing, is one of the things that I always sort of um, focus uh, on for students writing fiction because it, I think it's often overlooked, like what to um, what to highlight, what to minimise, um, how to do summary, how to blow something up into a scene. And actually, in the end, that is very much to do with how you are representing this place yep. and the point of view of the char- the point of view of the characters in it. Um, so, as, as a, a personal example, this book, um, "Last Days in the National Costume," is set um, in five weeks. So, the whole novel is contained within this five weeks of the um, blackout that happened in Auckland in 1998 that I mentioned before. Um, and actually, I, I wrote, um, it was only in my second draft of this novel that I came up with the idea of setting it during the blackout. It had just been a novel that sort of dribbled on into the ether before. And I thought, ah, the, the blackout. And so that contained it within five weeks. And as, as Peter said, what happened was it actually um, made a, um, it made the fictional world um, finite and therefore made it less real which I think is, is the trick of fiction, is to make um, whatever you're trying to write about. It's not real, it's fiction. Okay, so perfect that, place to stop. It. <laughs> Thank you very much to our panelists, and uh, we'll, you will please move on to the next panel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>